to the final episode of The Secret Life of Salmon. Throughout this series, we have followed the life cycle of our salmon superheroes, from their beginnings as eggs, to Alvin, to Fry and Smoltz. We followed them as they entered the ocean as adults, and finally journeyed back to the mouth of the river where they were hatched. But how do they find their way home? This is something scientists only partly understand. The complete truth about how salmon accomplish their truly amazing quest is still not fully understood. In this chapter, we will explain what we know about the last page of our salmon story and learn more about the challenges they encountered during this extraordinary migration back to their home waters. As salmon re-enter fresh water on the way back to their spawning grounds, several amazing physical changes take place. They stop eating and begin to live off the fat they gain during their time at sea, similar to what bears do when they hibernate. It's also at this point that they need to switch from being able to breathe in salt water to breathing in fresh water. This adaptation back to breathing in fresh water again is very hard on their bodies. To save energy, they stop producing the slime that normally protects their scales. Without this natural shield, their bodies are easily cut and bruised by rocks and logs along the way, causing them to lose their scales and grow fungus that eats away their flesh. The outward appearance of bucks changes most dramatically. They grow a big snout called a kipe and long teeth that stick out. They use them to fight off other bucks and get the attention of females. Bots change color to better blend with their surroundings and make them more attractive to hens. On their journey, salmon can travel as many as 15 to 30 miles per day. Swimming against the current, they jump up waterfalls and navigate around obstacles like dams, landslides, and fallen trees. Many don't survive these obstacles. Some become food for bears, eagles, otters, and people. Upon their return to natal waters, the hen salmon digs her red and bucks compete with others to be her mate. She deposits her eggs, the buck releases his milk to fertilize them, and the life cycle starts all over again. In the end, both parents die, but they don't stop contributing to their environment. Quite the opposite, their bodies become part of a complex food web. The dead salmon are critically important as a food source for creatures like bears, birds, and the insects young salmon will need to survive. The nutrients released from their bodies also provide food for trees, plants, and mushrooms growing throughout the forest. So now you can see how every piece of this complex food web benefits from a successful return of the salmon each year to spawn. Everything is interdependent here, one to the next. This ecosystem would be completely different without the salmon. Like their wild counterparts, hatchery-raised fish also return to the place where they were born. Once the hatchery salmon have arrived, workers catch them, separate males from females, and harvest the eggs and milt. The eggs harvested from hatchery-raised salmon are fertilized and placed in trays to incubate and grow. Scientists have found that when eggs from hatchery salmon are only fertilized with milk from hatchery-raised fish, the new generation of salmon will not be as likely to survive or grow as large as wild salmon, causing the hatchery fish to decline. So hatchery biologists mix in eggs and milk from wild salmon to increase their chances of survival. Because of this, baby hatchery salmon can inherit some of the traits of their wild relatives, including knowledge of how to avoid predators and an ability to find the way back to their home stream. These traits tend to be stronger in wild than in hatchery raised fish. The rivers and streams of the Pacific Northwest used to be so full of wild salmon that fishers like to say they can walk across the water on the backs of fish and never get their feet wet. Imagine that. Today, if salmon were the only means of crossing the rivers, those fishers would be out of luck. Because again, only 6% of the salmon that used to be here in the Pacific Northwest are here today. It's not just fishing that impacts salmon. Dams prevent rivers from flowing freely, which makes it very difficult for salmon to make it home to their spawning grounds. 
logging and tree removal also affect salmon because it muddies their streams. Farms in cities near rivers also create a lot of pollution that can make salmon sick. Scientists are doing all they can to understand more about salmon and what humans can do to help them survive and thrive again. However, there are many secrets about salmon that we still don't know. What we do know is that humans are the reason for the decline in salmon populations, but we can also be the ones that help the salmon to recover and live healthy lives. That's right, you and me and everybody we know can do something every day to improve the lives of salmon. The most important thing for you to understand is that you and the salmon are more connected than you might think. How? Take water. We depend on water for almost everything in our lives, from brushing our teeth, to farmers growing the food we eat, to keeping our clothes and dishes clean. Even the electricity powering our homes and schools comes from water flowing over dams here in the Pacific Northwest. We take free flowing water for granted, but for salmon, every drop is important. How can you help? Pay attention to how many times you use water each day and ask yourself, how can I use less? Turn off the tap while you're washing your hands and brushing your teeth. Take shorter showers or fewer baths and encourage your friends and family to do the same. Think about what you can do to help salmon. With just a little extra effort, you, your family and friends can make a real difference in helping these truly fascinating superheroes. You can get to know salmon up close and personal by looking for them yourself. In September or October, find a river or stream in your watershed and sit there for a while. Be patient, watch the shallow waters. You just might be lucky enough to see salmon moving beneath the surface. Finally, share the secrets you've learned about salmon with family and friends. The more we know about something, the more we will care for it. The sooner humans care more deeply about salmon, the sooner their numbers will start to increase in our rivers and streams. Thank you for joining us for The Secret Life of Salmon. I hope you've learned a lot and that you think these fish are as amazing as I do. Even with all that we know today, there are still secrets yet to be discovered. Who knows, you might be the one to uncover the next mystery of these superheroes we call salmon.